So welcome to Singular Characters, a unique evening with Nathaniel Hawthorne, who is being portrayed by Rob Valella, and Henry David Thoreau, who is being portrayed by Richard Smith. Uh, tonight's Living History interpreters will explore the relationship of Thoreau and Hawthorne using their original words to convey their thoughts on the 19th century world, their contemporaries like Alcott and Emerson, and of course, one another. Nathaniel Hawthorne and American literary history are one of the central stories that we share with visitors at the House of the Seven Gables, along with the property's role in the growth of maritime wealth and trade and as a settlement house. We have managed to find many, many ways to stay open and to share our histories and our stories over the past year. And we are so grateful for everyone's support and allowing us to do so. And even by attending a program like this, you're helping to support even more of sharing our stories. Uh, in 2021, our theme for the year is called What's the Story? And we are taking this year to really explore some of the lore and legends of our historic site and its very big cast of characters. Uh, many of you on the call I know are local. I've seen some of my favorite names pop up. Uh, and you know that we were founded by a woman named Caroline Emerton as an organization. She purchased the mansion in 1908. She restored it, opened it up as a museum, and used those proceeds to fund settlement house work. The organization welcomed immigrants into Salem and offered a variety of educational opportunities to help them literally settle into American life. Um, we're so proud that we're able to keep on this tradition today of preserving our National Historic Landmark District and also by supporting newly arriving immigrant families coming to the greater Salem area as well. Um, one example of that is thanks to the Van Otterloo Family Foundation, the Cummings Foundation, and a partnership with the Peabody Essex Museum. We have been able to host our in-person adult ESL and citizenship classes since May and it has felt for all of us as staff and for our students one of those true return to normalcy feelings and we're delighted to be able to offer that. Um, in 2021, we have been able to expand our reach for special programs thanks to the magic of Zoom. So we're de so delighted to have all of you on tonight. Uh, whether you are in the coast of Maine or the mountains of Montana, uh, we're just delighted to have you uh, exploring Salem history and exploring these two literary legends with us tonight. Just a quick few housekeeping notes. Um, we will keep you muted while Hawthorne and Thoreau are speaking uh, for the kind of ease of the presentation and for them to be able to kind of present the best way possible to all of you. Uh, we are suggesting cameras off for the best recording experience, uh, but before Q&A, we absolutely encourage you to restart your videos if you would like to, and we'll give you a reminder on that as well. And my colleague Kaylee and I, uh, who's on here as well, will be managing Q&A and the chat. We encourage you as the program is going on, if a question pops into your head, go right ahead and put that in the chat. We'll compile those and help to ask those as Q&A begins after the presentation. And if you would also like to make any comments, um, I hear that our authors are very interested in the comments you have to say about them and their work. So we would love to hear from you in the chat with that as well. So kind of with that introduction, we are now ready to step back into uh, New England of the mid 1800s with uh, Henry David Thoreau and Nathaniel Hawthorne. May 27th, 1842. Dearest heart, I met Mr. Emerson at the Athenaeum yesterday. He tells me our garden, etc., at the old manse makes fine progress. Would that we were there already. I am born David Henry Thoreau in this American town, in this place called Concord. I have never got over my surprise that I should have been born in the most estimable place in all the world and in the very nick of time too. July 10th, 1842. The execution took place yesterday. We made a Christian end and came straight to paradise where we are abiding at this present writing. We are as happy as people can be uh, without making themselves ridiculous 
and might even be happier. Uh, but as a matter of taste, we choose to stop short at this point. Sophia is very well and sends her love. Mr. Emerson tells me he has written to Miss Elizabeth Hoare upon meeting Mr. Hawthorne. I like him well, he says. A journal for September 1st, 1842. Mr. Mr. Thorough dined with us yesterday. T-H-O-R-O-W, yes. He is a singular character, a young man with much of wild original nature still remaining in him. And so far as he is sophisticated, it is in a way and method of his own. He is ugly as sin, long-nosed, queer-mouthed, and with uncouth and rustic, uh, though courteous, manners, corresponding very well with such an exterior. But his ugliness is of an honest and agreeable fashion and becomes him much better than beauty. He formerly kept school in this town, but for two or three years back, he has uh, repudiated all regular modes of getting a living and seems inclined to lead a sort of Indian life among civilized men. And Indian life, I mean, as respects the absence of any systematic method of earning a living. Mr. Thoreau is a keen and delicate observer of nature, a, a genuine observer, which I suspect is almost as rare a character as even a, an original poet. And nature, in return for his love, seems to adopt him as her especial child and shows him secrets, which few others are allowed to witness. He is familiar with beast, fish, fowl, and reptile, and has strange stories to tell of adventures and friendly passages with these lower brothers of mortality. Herb and flower, likewise, wherever they grow, whether in garden or wild wood, are his familiar friends. He is also on intimate terms with the, the clouds and can tell the portents of storms. It is a characteristic trait that he has a great regard for the memory of the Indian tribes whose wild life would have suited him well. And strange to say, he seldom walks over a plowed field without picking up an arrow point, spearhead, or other relic of the red man, as if their spirits willed him to be the inheritor of their simple wealth. From my journal, April 26th, 1841. The Indian stands free and unconstrained in nature, is her inhabitant and not her guest, and wears her easily and gracefully. But the civilized man has the habits of the house. His house is a prison. To Epis Sargent, editor of the New Monthly Magazine. There is a gentleman in this town by the name of Thoreau, a graduate of Cambridge, and a fine scholar, especially in old English literature, but withal a wild, irregular, Indian-like sort of fellow who can find no occupation uh, in life that suits him. He writes, and sometimes often, for aught I know, very well indeed. He is somewhat tinctured with uh, transcendentalism, but I think him capable of becoming a very valuable contributor to your magazine. Would it not be worth his, worthwhile to try Mr. Thoreau's pen? Uh, the man has stuff in him uh, to make a reputation of. And I wish that you might find it consistent with your interest to aid him in attaining that object. In common with the rest of the public, I shall look for character and individuality in the magazine which you are to edit. And it seems that this Mr. Thoreau might do something towards marking it out from the ordinary catalog of such publications. Rather than love, than money, than fame, give me truth. The fact is I am a mystic, 
a transcendentalist, and a natural philosopher to boot. Mr. Thoreau has more than a tincture of literature, a deep and true taste for poetry, especially the elder poets. And he is a good writer, so true, innate, and literal in observation, yet giving the spirit as well as letter of what he sees, even as a lake reflects its wooded banks showing every leaf, yet giving the wild beauty of the whole scene. Uh, then there are, are in his articles uh, passages of cloudy and dreamy metaphysics, and also passages where his thoughts seem to measure and attune themselves into spontaneous verse, as they rightfully may, since there is real poetry in him. There is a basis of good sense and of moral truth, too, throughout his article, which also is a reflection of his character, for he is not unwise to think and feel, and I find him a healthy and wholesome man to know. From my essay, Walking, 1852, in literature, it is only the wild that attracts us. Dullness is but another name for tameness. It is the uncivilized free and wild thinking in Hamlet and the Iliad, in all the scriptures and mythologies not learned in the schools that delights us. As the wild duck is more swift and beautiful than the tame, so is the wild, the mallard thought, which mid falling dews wings its way above the fens. A truly good book is something as natural and as unexpectedly and unaccountably fair and perfect as a wild flower discovered on the prairies of the West or in the jungles of the East. Genius is a light which makes the darkness visible like the lightning's flash, which perchance shatters the temples of knowledge itself and not a taper lighted at the hearthstone of the race, which pales before the light of common day. Walked with Margaret Fuller and talked about autumn and about the pleasures of getting lost in the woods and about the crows whose voices Margaret had heard and about the experiences of early childhood whose influence remains upon the character after the collection of them has passed away and about the sigh of mountains from a distance and the view from their summits and about other matters of high and low philosophy. Mr. Emerson tells me that Miss Fuller has written to him, quote, you will find Hawthorne more mellow than most fruits at your board and that distinct flavor too. Dear Margaret Fuller, Sophia has told me of her conversation with you about our receiving Mr. Ellery Channing and your sister as inmates of our household. I found that my wife's ideas were not altogether unfavorable to the plan, which together with your own implied opinion in its favor has led me to consider it with a good deal of attention. I worry, however, that the comfort of both parties would be put in great jeopardy. In saying this, it would not be understood to mean anything against the social qualities of Mr. and Mrs. Channing, uh, my objection being wholly independent of such considerations. Had it been proposed to Adam and Eve to receive two angels in their paradise as boarders, I doubt whether they would have been altogether pleased to consent. Channing is the moodiest person that I know. When I was at his house the other evening, he punched his cat with the poker because she was purring too loudly for him. Still, Ellery was the one who came from the farthest to my lodge when I lived at Walden Pond, through deepest snows and most dismal tempests. A farmer, a hunter, a soldier, a reporter, even a philosopher may be daunted, but nothing can deter a poet for he is actuated by pure love. Who can predict his comings and goings? His business calls him out at all hours, even when doctors sleep. We made my small house ring with boisterous mirth and resound with the murmur of such so much sober talk, making amends then to Walden Vale for the long silences. 
Broadway was still and deserted in comparison. At suitable intervals, there were regular salutes of laughter, which might have been referred indifferently to the last uttered or the forthcoming jest. We made many a brand new theory of life over a thin dish of gruel. That was from my book, Walden, 1854. Mr. Emerson comes sometimes and has been so far favored as to be feasted on our nectar and ambrosia. Mr. Emerson, the, the mystic, stretching his hand out of cloud land in vain search for something real, a great searcher for facts, but they seem to melt away and become unsubstantial in his grip. From my journal, 1841. Emerson, Emerson again is a critic, poet, philosopher with talent not so conspicuous, not so adequate to his task, but his field is still higher, his task more arduous. He lives a far more intense life seeks to realize a divine life. His affections and intellect equally developed, has advanced farther and a new heaven opens to him. Love and friendship, religion, poetry, the holy are familiar to him. The life of an artist, mover vegreated, more observing, finer perception, not so robust, elastic, practical enough in his own field, faithful, a judge of men. Emerson has special talents unequaled. The divine in man has had no more easy, methodically distinct expression. His personal influence upon young persons is greater than any man's. In his world, every man would be a poet. Love would reign. Beauty would take place. Man and nature would harmonize. And Mr. Alcott, it is impossible to quarrel with him or he would take all your harsh words like a saint. Alcott is a geometer, a visionary, one of the last of the philosophers. Connecticut gave him to the world. He peddled first her wares, afterwards, as he declares, his brains. These he peddles still, prompting God and disgracing man, bearing for, his, bearing for fruit his brain like the nut its kernel. I think that he must be the man of the most faith of any alive. His words and attitudes always suppose a better state of things than other men are acquainted with, and he will be the last man to be disappointed as the ages revolve. He has no venture in the present, but though comparatively disregarded now, when his day comes, Laws unsuspected by most will take effect, and masters of families and rules will come to him for advice. He is a true friend of man, almost the only friend of human progress. With his hospitable intellect, he embraces children, beggars, insane, and scholars, and entertains the thoughts of all, adding to it commonly some breadth and elegance. He is perhaps the sanest man and has the fewest crotchets of any I chance to know. He is the same yesterday and tomorrow, a blue robed man whose fittest roof is the overarching sky which reflects his serenity. I do not see how he can ever die. Nature cannot spare him. Uh, I lived briefly within the Brook Farm community there I have been chopping wood and turning a grindstone all the forenoon. And such occupations are likely to disturb the equilibrium of the muscles and sinews. It is an endless surprise to me how much work there is to be done in the world. But thank God I am able to do my share of it and my ability increases daily. What a great, a uh, broad-shouldered elephantine personage I shall become by and by. <clears throat> uh, later, however, I found this to be less of a positive observation. Labor is the curse of the world and nobody can meddle with it without becoming proportionately uh, brutified. As for these communities like Brook Farm, I had rather keep bachelor's hall in hell than go to board in heaven. Uh, as for Thoreau, 
there is one chance in a thousand that he might write a most excellent and readable book. But I should be sorry to take the responsibility, either towards you or him, of stirring him up to write anything for a series. He is the most unmalleable fellow alive, the most tedious, tiresome, and intolerable, the narrowest and most notional, and, and yet, true as all this is, he has great qualities of intellect and character. The only way, however, in which he could ever approach the popular mind would be by writing a book of simple observation of nature. From my lecture called Walking or the Wild. We had a remarkable sunset one day last November. I was walking in a meadow, the source of a small brook, when the sun at last, just before setting after a cold gray day, reached a clear stratum in the horizon and the softest, brightest morning sunlight fell on the dry grass and on the stems of the trees in the opposite horizon and on the leaves of the shrub oaks on the hillside, while our shadows stretched long over the meadow eastward as if we were the only motes in its beams. It was such a light as we could not have imagined a moment before, and the air also was so warm and serene that nothing was wanting to make a paradise of that meadow. When we reflected that this was not a solitary phenomenon, never to happen again, but that it would happen forever and ever an infinite number of evenings and cheer and reassure the latest child that walked there, it was more glorious still. The sun sets on some retired meadow where no house is visible, with all the glory and splendor that it lavishes on cities and perchance as it has never set before where there is but a solitary marsh hawk to have his wings gilded by it, or only a musquash looks out from his cabin, and there is some little black veined brook in the midst of the marsh, just beginning to meander, winding slowly round a decaying stump. We walked in so pure and bright a light, gilding the withered grass and leaves so softly and serenely bright, I thought I had never bathed in such a golden flood without a ripple or a murmur to it. The west side of every wood and rising ground gleamed like the boundary of Elysium, and the sun on our backs seemed like a gentle herdsman driving us home at evening. So we saunter toward the Holy Land, till one day the sun shall shine more brightly than ever he has done, shall perchance shine into our minds and hearts, and light up our whole lives with a great awakening light, so warm and serene and golden as on a bankside in autumn. I have skated like a very schoolboy this winter. Indeed, since my marriage, the circle of my life seems to have come around and brought back many of my school day enjoyments. And I find a deeper pleasure in them now than when I first went over them. Now, I have missed Ellery Channing very much in my skating expeditions. Has he quite deserted us for good and all? How few people in this world know how to be idle. It is a much higher faculty than any sort of usefulness or ability. I do not mean to deny Ellery's ability for any sort of vulgar usefulness, but uh, he certainly can lie in the sun. Ellery has published his first volume of poetry. As for myself, I find his literary style to be sublimo slipshod. Uh, this Edgar A. Poe has reviewed Ellery's book saying, quote, it may be said in his favor that nobody ever heard of him. Like an honest woman, he has always succeeded in keeping himself from being made the subject of gossip. His book contains about 63 things, which he calls poems and which he has no doubt seriously supposed them to be. They are full of all kinds of mistakes, of which the most important is that of their having been printed at all. They are not precisely English, nor will we insult a great nation by calling them Kickapoo. Perhaps they are Channing Ease. 
from a letter by Mrs. Hawthorne to her sister, April 6th, 1843. Do you read the Democratic Review? The Celestial Railroad for the April number is unique and of deep significance. It is a rare privilege to hear my husband read his manuscript aloud with the true expression. The walking is so bad in the country in winter that only tall boots can cope with it. Unaware as one foot sinks down to the celestial empire and the other anchors in the moon. Oh, uh, Mr. Thorough has been here pretty often and is very interesting. Mr. Emerson from January was at the South, so uh, Sirius was not visible to the eye for nearly three months. Sometimes Emerson is so great, you cannot get within 10 feet of him. Yeah, after dinner, at which we cut the first watermelon and muskmelon that our garden has grown, Mr. Thorough and I walked up the bank of the river, and at a certain point he shouted for his boat. Forthwith, a young man paddled it across, and Mr. Thorough and I voyaged farther up the stream, which soon became more beautiful than any picture with its dark and quiet sheet of water, uh, half shaded, half sunny, between high and wooded banks. Mr. Thorough managed the boat so perfectly, either with two paddles or with one, that it seemed instinct with his own will and to require no physical effort to guide it. He said that when some Indians visited Concord a few years ago, he found that he had acquired without a teacher their precise method of propelling and steering a canoe. Nevertheless, he was desirous of selling the boat of which he was so fit a pilot and which was built by his own hands. So I agreed to take it and accordingly became possessor of the Muscatiquid. I wish I could acquire the aquatic skill of the original owner. Our boat, the Muscatiquid, which had cost us a week's labor in the spring, was in form like a fisherman's dory, 15 feet long by three and a half in breadth at the widest part, painted green below with a border of blue, with reference to the two elements in which it was to spend its existence. It was strongly built, but heavy, and hardly a better model than usual. If rightly made, a boat would be a sort of amphibious animal, a creature of two elements, related by one half its structure to some swift and shapely fish, and by the other to some strong winged and graceful bird. Yesterday afternoon, Mr. Thorough arrived with the boat. I entered the boat with him in order to have the benefit of a, a lesson in rowing and paddling. I managed indeed to propel the boat by rowing with two oars, but the use of the single paddle is quite beyond my present skill. Mr. Thorough had assured me that it was only necessary to will the boat to go in any particular direction and she would immediately take the course as if imbued with the spirit of the steersman. Well, it may be so with him, but it is certainly not so with me. The boat seemed to be bewitched and turned its head to every point of the compass except the correct one. He then took the paddle himself and though I could observe nothing peculiar in his management of it, the Muscatiquid immediately became as docile as a trained steed. I suspect that she has not yet transferred her affections from her old master to the new one. By and by, when we are better acquainted, she should grow more tractable. We propose to change her name from Muscatiquid, uh, the Indian name of the Concord River, meaning the River of Meadows to the pond lily, which will be very beautiful and appropriate as during the summer season, she will bring home many a cargo of pond lilies from along the river's weedy shore. It is not very likely that I shall make such long voyages in her as Mr. Thorough has made. He once followed our river down to the Merrimack and thence, I believe, to Newburyport in his little craft. 
Mr. Thorough. He is an odd and clever young man with nothing very peculiar about him, uh, some originality and self-inspiration in his character, but none or very little in his intellect. Nevertheless, the lad himself seems to feel as if he were a genius. I like him well enough, however, but after all these originals in a small way, after one has seen a few of them, become more dull and commonplace than even those who keep the ordinary pathway of life. They have a, a rule and a routine, which they follow with as little variety as other people do their rule and their routine. And when once we have fathomed their mystery, nothing can be more wearisome. An innate perception and reflection of truth give the only sort of originality that does not finally grow intolerable. The seasons were not made in vain. The winter was made to concentrate and harden and mature the kernel of man's brain, to give tone and firmness and consistency to his thought. Then is the great harvest of the year, the harvest of thought, from my journal, 1854. Two, Henry D. Thoreau from Salem. October 21st, 1848. My dear sir, the managers of the Salem Lyceum some time ago voted that you should be requested to deliver a lecture before that institution during the approaching season. Uh, permit me to add my own earnest wishes that you will accept it, and also laying aside my official dignity to express my wife's desire and my own that you will be our guest if you do come. In case of your compliance, the managers would be glad to know at what time it will best suit you to deliver the lecture. Very truly yours, Nathaniel Hawthorne. Corresponding Secretary, Salem Lyceum. Oh, uh, P.S. I live at number 14, Mall Street, where I shall be very happy to see you. <clears throat> the stated fee for lectures is $20. After lecturing twice this winter, I feel that I am in danger of cheapening myself by trying to become a success, that is, to interest my audience. I fail to get even the attention of the masses. I should suit them better if I suited myself less. I would rather that my audience come to me than that I should go to them. I would rather write books than lectures. From Salem, February 19th, 1849. My dear Thoreau, the managers request that you will lecture before the Salem Lyceum on Wednesday evening after next, uh, that is to say on the 28th. May we depend on you? Uh, please to answer immediately if convenient. I hear that you have a book in press. I rejoice at it, and nothing doubt of such success as will be worth having. Should your manuscripts all be in the printer's hands, I suppose you can reclaim one of them for a single evening's use to be returned the next morning. Or perhaps that Indian lecture which you mentioned to me is in a state of forwardness. Either that or a continuation of the Walden experience, or indeed anything else, will be acceptable. We shall expect you at number 14 Mall Street. Very truly yours, Nathaniel Hawthorne. From Student Life, Its Aims and Employments. When I wrote the following pages, or rather the bulk of them, I lived alone in the woods a mile from any neighbor in a house which I had built myself on the shore of Walden Pond in Concord, Massachusetts and earned my living by the labor of my hands only. I lived there two years and two months. At present, I am a sojourner in civilized life again. I should not obtrude my affairs so much on the notice of my listeners if very particular inquiries had not been made by my townsmen concerning my mode of life, which some would call impertinent, 
though they do not appear to me at all impertinent, but considering the circumstances are very natural and pertinent. Some have asked what I got to eat if I did not feel lonesome, if I was not afraid and the like. Others have been curious to learn what portion of my income I devoted to charitable purposes, and some, who have large families, how many poor children I maintain. I will therefore ask those of my auditors who feel no particular interest in me to pardon me if I undertake to answer some of these questions in this lecture. In most lectures, the I or first person is omitted. In this, it will be retained. That, in respect to egotism, is the main difference. We commonly do not remember, after all, that it is always the first person that is speaking. I should not talk so much about myself if there were anybody else whom I knew as well. Unfortunately, I am confined to this theme by the narrowness of my experience. <clears throat> well, uh, Mrs. Hawthorne reflected on uh, Mr. Thoreau's presentation to the Salem Lyceum. She says, Thoreau has risen above all his arrogance of manner and is as gentle, simple, ruddy, and meek as all geniuses should be. And now his great blue eye fairly outshines and put into shade a nose, which I once thought must make him uncomely forever. His lecture was so enchanting such a revelation of nature in all its exquisite detail of wood thrushes, squirrels, sunshine, mists and shadows, fresh vernal odors, pine tree ocean melodies, that my ears rank with music, and I seem to have been wandering through copse and dingle. A review of my lecture from the Salem Observer. <clears throat> Quote, Henry S. Thoreau of Concord, New Hampshire, gave his auditors a lecture on Wednesday evening sufficiently Emersonian to have come from the great philosopher himself. We were reminded of Emerson continually. In thought, style, and delivery, the similarity were equally obvious. There was uh, the same keen philosophy running through him, the same jutting forth of brilliant edges of meaning. Even in tone of voice, Emerson was brought strikingly to the ear, and in personal appearance also, we fancied some resemblance. The performance has created quite the sensation amongst the Lyceum goers. <clears throat> I have uh, since moved to Lenox in Western Massachusetts and befriended an author named Herman Melville. March weather prevented walks abroad. And so we spent most of the week in smoking and talking metaphysics in the barn. I usually lounging upon a carpenter's bench. When I was leaving, I jocosely declared I would write a report of our psychological discussion for publication in a book <laughs> to be called A Week on a Workbench in a Barn, uh, that title being a travesty upon that of Thoreau's recent book, A Week on the Concord River. I was up early and perched upon the top of this tower of the Berkshire Mountains to see the daybreak. As the light increased, I discovered around me an ocean of mist which by chance reached up exactly to the base of the tower and shut out every vestige of the earth. It revealed to me more clearly the new world into which I had risen in the night, the new terra firma perchance of my future life. There was not a crevice left through which the trivial places we name Massachusetts or Vermont or New York could be seen while I still inhaled the clear atmosphere of a July morning if it were July there. All around beneath me was spread for a hundred miles on every side, as far as the eye could reach, an undulating country of clouds answering in the varied swell of its surface to the terrestrial world it veiled. It was such a country as we might see in dreams with all the delights of paradise. Uh, we have moved back to Concord from the hilltop 
there is a good view along the extensive level surfaces and gentle hilly outlines covered with woods that characterizes the scenery of Concord. We have not so much as a gleam of lake or river in the prospect. If there were, it would add greatly to the value of the place in my estimation. The house stands within uh, 10 or 15 yards of the Boston Road along which the British marched and retreated, divided from it uh, by a fence, some trees and shrubbery of Mr. Alcott's setting out, whereupon I've called it the wayside, which I think a better name and more morally suggestive than that which, as Mr. Alcott has since told me, he bestowed on it, the, the hillside. I know nothing about the history of the house except Thoreau's telling me that it was inhabited a generation or two ago by a man who believed that he should never die. I believe, however, that he is dead. At least I hope so, else he may possibly appear and disturb my title to his residence. Julian Hawthorne, Mr. Hawthorne's son on Mr. Thoreau. Once when I was nearly seven years old, Thoreau came to the wayside to make a survey of our land bringing the surveying apparatus on his shoulder. I watched the short, dark, unbeautiful man with interest and followed him about all over the place, never losing sight of a movement and never asking a question or uttering a word. The thing must have lasted a couple of hours. When we got back, Thoreau remarked to my father, good boy, sharp eyes and no tongue. On my visit to Walden Pond, embosomed, among wooden hills, not very extensive, but large enough for waves to dance upon its surface and to look like a piece of blue firmament, earth encircled. None but angels should bathe there. From a letter to my sister Sophia, July 13th, 1852, dear Sophia, they say that Mr. Franklin Pierce, the presidential candidate, was in town last 5th of July visiting Hawthorne, whose college chum he was, and that Hawthorne is writing a life of him for electioneering purposes. To Franklin Pierce from Concord, July 5th, 1852. Dear Pierce, to say the truth, your conduct is so unlike that of most other political men that your biographer's task becomes more difficult. Instead of uh, thrusting yourself forward on all good or bad occasions, you're always required a case of necessity to bring you out. And having done the needful with as little noise as possible, you withdrew into the background. <laughs> From Horace Mann, Mr. Hawthorne's brother-in-law, quote, if he makes out Pierce to be a great man or a brave man, it will be the greatest work of fiction he ever wrote. The biography has cost me hundreds of friends here at the North who had a purer regard for me than Frank Pierce ever gained and who drop off from me like autumn leaves. I do detest all offices, all at least that are held on political tenure. And I want nothing to do with politicians. Their hearts wither away and die out of their bodies. Their consciences are turned to India rubber or some substance as black as that, and which will uh, stretch as much. We are a nation of politicians. What is called politics is comparatively something so superficial and inhumane that practically I have never fairly recognized that it concerns me at all. The newspapers, I perceive, devote some of their columns specially to politics or government without charge. And this, one would say, is all that saves it. But as I love literature and to some extent the truth also, I never read those columns at any rate. I do not wish to blunt my sense of right so much. I have not got to answer for having read a single president's message from Life Without Principle, 1854. From Liverpool, August 4th, 1853. I began my services, such as they are, on Monday last, August 1st. And here I sit in my private room at the consulate, while the vice consul and clerk car are carrying on affairs in the outer office. Uh, many scenes which I should have liked to record have occurred, 
but the pressure of business has prevented me from recording them from day to day. From my journal, August, 1856. Better for me, says my genius, to go cranberrying this afternoon in Gowing Swamp, to get but a pocket full and learn its peculiar flavor, I, and the flavor of Gowing Swamp and the life of New England, than to go consul in Liverpool and get I don't know how many thousands of dollars for it with no such flavor. A British man here in Liverpool said that in the next voyage of the Mayflower, after she carried the pilgrims, she was employed in transporting a cargo of slaves from Africa to the West Indies, I suppose. This is a queer fact and would be nuts for the Southerners. From Slavery in Massachusetts, July 4th, 1854. Much has been said about American slavery, but I think that we do not even yet realize what slavery is. If I were seriously to propose to Congress to make mankind into sausages, I have no doubt that most of the members would smile at my proposition. And if any believed me to be in earnest, they would think that I proposed something much worse than Congress has ever done. But if any of them will tell me that to make a man into a sausage would be much worse, would be any worse than to make him into a slave than it was to enact the fugitive slave law, I will accuse him of foolishness, of intellectual incapacity, of making a distinction without a difference. The one is just as sensible a proposition as the other. How does it become a man to behave towards this American government today? I answer that he cannot without disgrace be associated with it. I cannot for an instant recognize that political organization as my government, which is the slave's government also. I have not the slightest sympathy for the slaves, or at least not half so much as for the laboring whites, who I believe are 10 times worse off than the Southern Negroes. John Brown is a man of rare common sense and directness of speech as of action, a transcendentalist above all, a man of ideas and principles, that was what distinguished him. Not yielding to a whim or transient impulse, but carrying out the purpose of a life. I did not notice, or I noticed that he did not overstate anything, but spoke within bounds. I am here to plead his cause with you. I plead not for his life, but for his character, his immortal life. And so it becomes your cause wholly is, and is not his in the least. Some 1800 years ago, Christ was crucified. This morning, perchance, Captain Brown was hung. These are the two ends of a chain, which is not without its links. He is not old Brown any longer. Now, he is an angel of light. I shall not pretend to be an admirer of old John Brown, nor did I expect ever to shrink so unutterably from the words of the conquered sage, whose happy lips have uttered a hundred golden sentences as from that saying that, that the death of this blood-stained fanatic has made the gallows as venerable as a cross. Nobody was ever more justly hanged, I say. He won his martyrdom fairly and took it firmly, he himself, I am persuaded, such was his natural integrity, would have acknowledged that Virginia had a right to take the life which he had staked and lost, although it would have been better for her in the hour that is fast coming, if she could generously have forgotten the criminality of his attempt in its enormous folly. On the other hand, any common sensible man looking at the matter unsentimentally must have felt a certain intellectual satisfaction in seeing him hang. I see now that it was necessary that the bravest and humanest man in all the country should be hung. Perhaps he saw it himself. I almost fear that I may yet hear of his deliverance, doubting if a pro prolonged life, if any life, can as do as much good as his death. From A Plea for Captain John Brown, 1859. Uh, unquestionably. Western man though he be, and Kentuckian by birth, President Lincoln is the essential representative of 
all Yankees. There was no describing his lengthy awkwardness nor the uncouthness of his movement. And yet it seemed as if I had been in the habit of seeing him daily and had shaken hands with him a thousand times in some village street. So true was he to the aspect of the pattern American. If put to guess his calling and livelihood, I should have taken him for a country schoolmaster as soon as anything else. Uh, he was dressed in a rusty black frock coat and pantaloons unbrushed and worn enough to become like an outer skin of the man. He had shabby slippers on his feet. His hair was black, still unmixed with gray, stiff, somewhat bushy, and had apparently been acquainted with neither brush nor a comb that morning after the disarrangement of the pillow. He has thick black eyebrows and an impending brow. His nose is large and the lines about his mouth are very strongly defined. The whole physiognomy is as coarse as one was as you might meet anywhere in the length and breadth of the States. But with all, it is redeemed, illuminated, softened, and brightened by a kind, though serious, look out of his eyes and an expression of homely sagacity, a great deal of native sense, no bookish cultivation, no refinement, honest at heart, and thoroughly so, yet in some sort uh, sly. But on the whole, I like this sallow, queer, sagacious visage with the homely human sympathies that warmed it. And for my small share in the matter, would as lief have Uncle Abe for a ruler as any man whom it would have been practicable to put in place. April, 1861. As to the condition of the country, though Lincoln has been president for nearly a month, I continue to feel as if we had no government at all. If the people at the North thus come to see clearly that there can be no union between freemen and slaveholders and vote and act accordingly, I shall think that we have purchased the progress cheaply by this revolution. A nation of 20 millions of freemen will be far more respectable and powerful than if 10 millions of slaves and slaveholders were added to them. The war, strange to say, has had a beneficial effect upon my spirits, which were flanging, flagging woefully before it broke out. Uh, but it was delightful to share in the heroic sentiment of the time and to feel that I had a country. Blessed are the young, for they do not read the president's message. Blessed are they who never read a newspaper, for they shall see nature and through her, God. If you come to America soon enough, you will have the pleasure of seeing the Union in its death throes. I, ashamed, I am ashamed to say how little I care about the matter. New England will still have her rocks and ice, and I should not wonder if we become a better and nobler people than ever be here for, before. As to the South, I never loved it. We do not belong together. The, the Union is unnatural, a scheme of man, not an ordinance of God. And as long as it continues, no American of either section will ever feel a genuine thrill of patriotism. May 1862. Even the death of friends will inspire us as much as their lives. They will leave consolation to the mourners as the rich leave money to defray the expenses of their funerals and their memories will be encrusted over with sublime and pleasing thoughts, as monuments of other men are overgrown with moss, for our friends have no place in the graveyard from a week on the Concord and Merrimack rivers. I have known Thoreau a good many years, but it would be quite impossible to comprise him within this little sheet of notepaper. He is an excellent scholar, and a man of most various capacity, insomuch that he could make his part good in any way of life, from the most barbarous to the most civilized. But there is more of the Indian in him, I think, than of any other kind of man. He despises the world and all that it has to offer, and like other uh, humorists, is an intol intolerable bore. 
I shall cause it to be made known to him that you sat up till two o'clock reading his book, and he will pretend that it is of no consequence, but he will never forget it. I ought not to forbear saying that he is an upright, conscientious, and courageous man of whom it is impossible to conceive anything but the highest integrity. Still, he is not an agreeable person, and in his presence, one feels ashamed of having any money or, or a house to live in, or so much as two coats to wear, or of having written a book that the public would read, his own mode of life being so unsparing a criticism on all other modes, such as the world approves. I do wish anything could be done to make his books known to the English public, for certainly they deserve it, being the work of a true man and full of true thought. You must not think that he is a particular friend of mine. I do not speak with quite this freedom of my friends. We have never been intimate, though my home is near his residence. From the New York Daily Tribune, May 10th, 1862. Henry D. Thoreau, the genial writer on the natural scenery of New England, died at Concord, Massachusetts on Tuesday, May 6th, after a protracted illness of more than 18 months. He was a native of Boston, but removed with his family at the age of five to Concord, where he has since resided. He graduated at Harvard College in 1837 and was nearly 45 years old at the time of his death. His writings included A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, Walden or Life in the Woods, and various contributions to the periodical literature of the day. They are remarkable for their freedom and originality of thought, their quaint humor, and their warm sympathy with all the manifold aspects of nature. His disease was consumption, and we are informed that his humor and cheerful courage did not forsake him during his sickness, and he met his death as gaily as Thermines in Xenophon. Mr. Thoreau, in spite of the racy individuality of his character, was much beloved and respected by his townsmen, and his writings have numerous admirers. He was honored with a public funeral from the town of Concord on Friday, the 9th instant. From Sophia Hawthorne. On Friday, Mr. Thoreau's funeral is to take place. He was, he was Concord itself in one man, and his death makes a very large vacuum. Of all the events which constitute a person's biography, there is scarcely one, none certainly of anything like a similar importance to which the world so easily reconciles itself as to his death. Obituary from the Boston Post, May 20th, 1864. Hawthorne is dead. The announcement will be a surprise to the people, to the lovers of American literature, it will send sorrow. His death occurred yesterday morning at Plymouth, New Hampshire. He was enjoying there in the course of a journey for health with ex-president Franklin Pierce, his lifelong friend. At two in the morning, his friend looked in upon him, and at three, he found him dead in his bed. Though he has long been an invalid, none of his friends supposed him to be so near his end. We hoped for some years more of labor for Hawthorne, but he is taken. We shall be thankful for what he has left behind him. There is no stain or dishonor in all he did. His books will become a great stone face upon which the young may look and yet may look a little longer until the lineaments of benevolence and goodness and power shall grow into their characters and make them the nobler for the vision of the superior which his genius has placed before them. And that's our program. And that's our program. I would like to introduce my partner. This is Rob Valella, literary historian as Mr. Hawthorne. 
And uh, one of my great friends and uh, most frequent collaborators, Richard Smith, who has been a historical interpreter of Thoreau all over the planet and for many, many years. Uh, this program <laughs> wrote ourselves years ago for the Thoreau Society, and it's nice to have a more Hawthorne-centric audience for it today. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yes. while you're, we, we would love to answer your questions if you have any, um, or just chat a little bit about the content of the program today. But as you're coming up and you're typing your questions, I just want to reiterate that this program was 99% made up of original words. So these are journal entries and letters and, and so forth. So this isn't stuff that Richard and I made up. This is the reality of what this relationship looked like and what their observations were. When we first decided to do this program, we thought, yeah, let's let's see if we can come up with some kind of a, a, a linear storyline to talk about the friendship between these two men, because they were both kind of loners. They didn't really like a lot of people, although Hawthorne tended to be a little more gregarious than Thoreau. And so I started going through Thoreau's journals and he mentions Hawthorne not once <laughs> in any of his journals. So from the very beginning, I'm thinking, oh, great. Now what are we going to do? But fortunately, they were surrounded by a bunch of chatty Cathy's <laughs> who wrote about everything and anything that these two guys talked about. So we were able to cobble together at least what we think was Thoreau's opinions about Hawthorne uh, and their friendship. Well, thank you for sitting in on our performance uh, or presentation. It's, it's a treat to bring these writers to life uh, for Richard and I. No matter how often we do it, it's, it's always an exciting opportunity for us. Yes, and we will encourage if there are any questions or comments in the chat, we would love for you to pop those in. You can also use the reactions feature, which will be down in the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you'd like to raise a hand, Kaylee will um, scroll, scroll through and uh, see if you have a hand raised, if you have a question you'd like to ask. Um, but I have a question for you, Richard. Um, I have always pronounced it as Henry David Thoreau, mm -hmm. but I have noticed that that is not quite correct. So I would, I would love to know um, a little bit more about the pronunciation of the name. So his, his grandfather was a French Huguenot and he came to America around 1773. We know that his name was Jean Thoreau or Jean Thoreau, but when you're in uh, Boston uh, in an English city in 1773, you don't really want to have a French name. And so we think that that's about the time that he anglicized it to John Thoreau. He did not change the spelling. Um, illiteracy, of course, was very high in the 18th century. Um, so he changed it, we think, to John Thoreau, which was Henry's dad's name, John Thoreau. The reason we know it was pronounced the way it was is primarily for Mr. Hawthorne. And at the beginning of our program, you know, Mr. Hawthorne said that he dined with Mr. T-H-O-R-O-W. So he was spelling it phonetically. We also know that at one time, Henry's dad won, he was a pencil maker. He won an award and the award was made out to John T-H-O-R-O-U-G-H. So again, that was being spelled phonetically as well. When I first moved to Concord, um, people started saying, well, yeah, if you're gonna portray this guy, you better learn to pronounce it correctly. So being the Ohio boy that I was, I had to learn to at least say some things in the New England dialect, including Thorough and Sophia and Concord and Gloucester <laughs> and everything else with the weird accents that you people have up here. <laughs> Quite true. Uh, a I see a raised hand in our audience. I'm gonna call on Peter and Joan Johnson. We're gonna ask them to unmute. If we can. I did, I just did. did. Okay. Wonderful presentation. I just, the, the, uh, the eye gestures between the two of you were fantastic. And I really thought it was, um, superb in this present moment to bring in all the issues about slavery. About, I had no, no concept of those, I should have, but no concept of those existing in the lives of, of those two gentlemen um, at that time. And it was a, quite an amazing revelation. So effect. thanks very much. Great job. Yeah, you know, the, go, ahead, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say the, 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 the anti-slavery movement 
in the 1850s was not dissimilar to the Black Lives Matter mo movement that's going on now in that there were people who thought it was extremely radical. There were people who thought the concepts are good, but I'm not really behind the methods. And there were people who were just like, I don't care about this. And I think it's difficult. I, you know, I, I felt that as I was reading Hawthorne's own words, it's hard to like Hawthorne on this issue because he doesn't see the problem with slavery. Um, the, the comment in there is that he thinks that um, the common working white man has it worse than an enslaved person. Um, and that's hard to, it's hard to hear, but it's, I, I promise it's harder for me to say out loud. But I should also say that Hawthorne's opinion was probably the opinion of a vast majority of Northerners. Uh, you know, a lot of people in Massachusetts, for instance, unless you were living in Boston, if you're in a small town like Concord or any other small farming town, slavery is a thousand miles away. You're not gonna see a lot of, of African-American people and most Northerners thought, well, yeah, it's bad, but what are you gonna do about it? So, so I like to think that, that people being radical abolitionists like Thoreau and, and others, they're the anomaly in the 19th century at least until 1850, after the fugitive slave law, that kind of turned more Northerners into abolitionists. But certainly throughout the 1830s and 40s, most Northerners were not overly concerned with slavery because it, they felt like it wasn't really affecting them one way or the other, even though they're wearing cotton clothing and they're eating rice and molasses. <laughs> but, but most Northerners were, were of Hawthorne's opinion, well, what are you gonna do about it? We're not saying that that was correct. We're just saying <laughs> we're just saying that's that's the historical record. <laughs> no, and it's uh, thank you for Peter and Joan for bringing that point up because it's always it's something that we at the site are trying to learn a little bit more about Hawthorne's views on the topic and to be able to try to better portray those views as we come up with a more inclusive history to develop the site. So, thank you for noticing uh, that fact as well. And then you know again, it's a it's something more for us to work on at the House of the Seven Gables and sharing Hawthorne's legacy as well. Um, so to you gentlemen, uh, lots of comments in the chat about how wonderful the presentation was, how much they everybody feels like they know the two authors so much better. Uh, but we have one kind of comment slash question that says, you know, I now have a much better sense of what Hawthorne admired in the thorough, as well as what he didn't or couldn't appreciate. What, if anything, do you think Thoreau might have admired in Hawthorne? Well, I mean... <laughs> Rob is laughing. <laughs> nothing, not one thing. Um, no, I think that what Thoreau admired in anybody was a person who was kind of doing his own thing and living his own life and, and making the best of his situation and doing what he can to be happy. And I think that he may have seen that in Hawthorne. Hawthorne's just kind of living his life and, and trying not to rock any boats, but also trying to make himself happy and raise his family and do what he needs to do in order to earn a few dollars and to try to write what he thinks is good literature. Maybe that's what Thoreau would have admired in him. There was no- I'm sorry to me to talk over you, but I was going to add, you know, I think the more we've done this program, the more it occurs to me and really solidifies in me, whether they liked it or not, Hawthorne and Thoreau had a, were very similar people. Yeah, they had a very different outlooks on the politics of the day or certain cultural things, but, you know, these are both very nature-oriented, solitary-minded people who have an interest in literature, and, uh, you know, whether they like it or not, I mean, they're those are, are really lined up between the two of them. And they both hated pretentious people and neither of these guys were pretentious. I agree Pretty much what you saw was what you got with them. They both kind of walked the walk and talked the talk. So I think they probably admired that in each other. Um, there was no pretension in either of these guys and they were surrounded by pretentious people uh, <laughs> yeah. almost yep. constantly. You know, and, and so I think that they admired that in each other, that there was no pretension. They were real guys to each other. And I think that they could, they could just kind of be themselves around each other. All right, uh, we had another question in the chat um, for Richard. Did you say that Thoreau's, the, I gotta say it right, um, was born David Henry Thoreau? 
Did they hear yes. that correctly? Yes. Okay. When, yes, he was. Um, he was. When, he was christened David Henry. David was an uncle of his that he never met. Uncle David died before Henry was born. As far as we know, though, they called him Henry uh, throughout most of his childhood. So when he graduated from Harvard in 1837, he just basically, without even saying it, said, "Okay, I am now Henry D. Thoreau." And if you see any of his period letters. Or, or even any, any of his essays or books, you never see the name David ever. It's always H.D. Thoreau or Henry D. Thoreau. He just stopped using it. And his family always called him Henry and they continue to call him Henry. So and, I, and I what's especially funny too is, you know, in those days, there's no paperwork to change your name because Hawthorne right. doesn't too. You know, it's Hawth Hawthorne's birth name, the family name doesn't have a W in it until like, like Thoreau, some time around the time he graduates college, he just says, you know, I'm going to stick a W in there. And the whole family followed suit. Nobody questioned it. Right. You know, Margaret Fuller was Sarah Margaret Fuller. She was never called Sarah. Ralph Waldo Emerson was called Ralph when he was a boy. But after he graduated from Harvard, he insisted on being called Waldo. Nobody ever called him Ralph Waldo. Nobody ever called the Thoreau Henry David. Nobody ever called Louisa May Alcott Louisa May. She was always Louisa. So, so the idea of the middle name, we're, we're awfully enamored by it. But to them, it was no big deal. I'm Henry. I've always been Henry. I'm going to keep being Henry. And, and nobody seemed to think it was that much of a deal, at least outside of the family. So another question that came in, and this is going to kind of be again a two-parter, so I'll start with uh, Richard first. Um, if Thoreau had to read something from Nathaniel Hawthorne, what do you think he would have selected? And then the question, same question to Rob, <laughs> if Hawthorne had to read something Thoreau, what do you think he would have selected? Well, I mean, maybe he would have read Mosses from an Old Manse because at least Thoreau is mentioned in Mosses from an Old Manse. So possibly, you know, I, I have a feeling that Thoreau's sister, Sophia, she liked novels. So she may have been reading House of the Seven Gables and Scarlet Letter and the other stuff. Um, but yeah, maybe he would have read at least the first chapter. Isn't the first chapter of Mosses from an Old Manse called The Old Manse? Yeah. Maybe he would, yeah. yeah, maybe Thoreau would have read that because at least that, that's not really fiction. That's pretty much a really great snapshot of, of Concord in 1842. So maybe Thoreau would have read that because at least it's not liter fiction per se. Right, I, you know, I think Hawthorne was very aware at least of Thoreau's writings. He's, I mean, there are a couple letters that I read from where he's essentially trying to get publishers to consider publishing his work. So I would presume that means Hawthorne at least was aware of Thoreau's writing, even if he didn't dig in too deeply. I would presume he read A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers because he references it a couple of times and owned the boat that took, you know, that was the, one of the stars of it. I would guess too, I would like to believe that he read Walden. And the reason I would guess that is that Hawthorne predicted that book. You know, early on in the program today, Hawthorne says, if Thoreau is ever gonna be known in literature, it's gonna be writing a book about simple observations of nature. And I think that was him kind of predicting Walden, whether he knew it or not. Right. And, and didn't, he, didn't he try to get both people in England to read both of Thoreau's books? Right. And there's, so there's, uh, the, I think the very last letter that I quoted from was him saying that, you know, this guy deserves an English audience. Right. And he says, but listen, we weren't friends. We just lived near each other. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is his way of saying like, look, I'm not just being promotional. I really believe in this, this guy's writing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I know and this guy who wrote these had books. Some pull. So, <laughs> yeah. I know, I know this guy who wrote this, these books. I don't know if I really like him, but the books are okay. Yeah. <laughs> so another question that came in about uh, Thoreau on this is, of course, Hawthorne lives in many places in Salem and the north of Boston area and around the world. Hawthorne is, you know, uh, at the House of the Seven Gables, we know so much about this and it's kind of, you know, what Hawthorne is known for is living in many different locations. Um, where was Thoreau's kind of farthest away address from Massachusetts? Uh, he lived in New York City for about six months in the summer of 1863. And that was about it, except for 
New York City in 18, I'm sorry, 1843, um, and Walden Pond from 1845 to 1847, um, and a couple of times with Emerson, he lived with his mom and dad all of his life. Um, and the farthest he ever traveled was to Minnesota. He went to Canada once, which he hated. He said the only thing he got out of Canada was a cold. Um, he, he went to New York a couple of times. He went to Cape Cod four times. He went to Maine three times. He went to the Berkshires once. That was it. Uh, he, he literally was born, lived, and died in Concord, Massachusetts. And they lived in so, like six or seven different houses in Concord. Um, so he, he was a Concord boy through and through, and he really had no, no desire to live anyplace else. Never went to Europe. Um, like I said, he only went to Canada, had no desire to go to Europe. You know, why, why see the Alps when you can see Punkatawset Hill in Concord? <laughs> why, see, why see the Rhine when you can see the Concord River? <laughs> why see the ocean when you can see Walden Pond? So he was pretty much happy being in Concord. Haley, are there any questions in the chat that we've missed? Um, yeah, Susan was wondering if you guys, if you two had the opportunity to take a canoe trip similar to the one that Thoreau and Hawthorne, similar one. Yeah. I've, I've taken the trips, I just have never done it with Rob. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I guarantee that I would have the same level of skill in a boat that Hawthorne did, so. <laughs> And you, you wouldn't see either of us ice skating on Concord River either. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> um, and another one. So a lot of the time we hear that Hawthorne changed his name to add a W in it to distance himself from Judge Hawthorne. Anything to say on that? You know, I, I think that's a tough one. I think that's, that's a reasoning that we as modern readers and fans have assigned, but there's not a lot of contemporary evidence. My guess, and I know this is boring, but my guess is that Hawthorne added the W because that's how people were pronouncing it anyway. Um, but, you know, it, especially when you think about, was he ashamed of it? I don't know that he was ashamed of that relationship. I think he struggled with it and was constantly exploring what it meant. I mean, The House of the Seven Gables, that novel is partly based on this exploration of like, what does it mean to be related to somebody who you never met, but has, you know, left this legacy for you? Is it good? Is it bad? Can I ever escape it? And he's got lots of stories that are exploring that same theme. So I don't know if ashamed is the word. Fascinated is probably the word. And, and let's face it, Hawthorne is not the only New Englander at the time who came from a Puritan background. Almost everybody in Massachusetts came from a Puritan background. Yeah, especially these people with triple names. Right, yeah. So, so, and you know, I think by, certainly by the 1840s and 50s, I mean, Puritanism, it was 200 years ago by 1850. So I think a lot of them kind of, they kind of dealt with their past, you know, it's like, like anybody else, if you find out your ancestor was a robber or a thief or something, you just kind of deal with it. But, you know, at the same time, I think that's such an important point. Let's take a, a book like The Scarlet Letter. I would argue that that book is just as much about 1850, the year in which it was published, as it was about those Puritan times that it depicts. You know, I think one of the Absolutely. things that Hawthorne is kind of getting at is, you know, how we really changed that much in those 200 years. We have another question that kind of goes back to the, the radicalism at the time. And the question is for both of you, have you ever found much evidence in your research on how either character felt about radical abolitionists like William Lloyd Garrison? You, you can take that one first, Rob. We know how Mr. Hawthorne felt about radical abolitionists. Yeah, he thought it was terrible. Um, and he you know, I think in a lot of ways, Hawthorne was suspicious of any attempt at reform because all of these attempts at improving culture, society, the country, he never saw them as successful. So I think he would have seen, I don't know if I can think of anything specific to Garrison, but certainly any form of, of reformism or any form of radicalism, he was very suspicious of. On the other hand, Thoreau came from an abolitionist family. 
Um, his mom and sisters were some of the founders of the Concord Female Anti-Slavery Society. They were all diehard Garrisonians. Um, they believed in Garrison's motto of no union with slaveholders. Garrison, Wendell Phillips, Frederick Douglass, when they would come to Concord, they would stay at the Thoreau House. Um, they all advocated disunion. Um, <laughs> they, all, they all signed petitions saying that the North should secede from the South. They all signed petitions against the uh, addition of Texas to the Union. <laughs> so the Thoreaus were, were diehard Garrisonians and, uh, and they were actually really good friends with him. I don't see any last questions in the thought. Are there any parting words you would like to leave us with before we wrap up? This, uh, this has been an absolute pleasure doing this for the House of Seven Gables. And I would absolutely like to thank everybody who's joined us literally from all over the country. Uh, we're really glad that you decided to spend the evening with us and we really appreciate it. I would echo that. Your questions were fantastic. And I would also say this, no matter where you are, especially in this post, slowly getting to be a post-pandemic period, remember to support your local historical societies, museums, and cultural institutions. They need your support. Uh, I'm, I know the two of us are very thankful that these organizations exist. We wouldn't be able to do what we do without them. Right. And by all means, read Walden and the Scarlet Letter and Henry's journals and Hawthorne's journals and anything else you come across. Great advice from you both. Thank you so much. So I just thank also so want to say thank you so much. We appreciate um, all of our members who joined us tonight, uh, program donors who joined us this evening. Uh, your support, like your support makes programming like this possible. And not only are you supporting our historic site and the House of the Seven Gables, but you're supporting the work of people like Rob and Richard, who are just incredibly talented historians who are keeping these literary legends alive and in front of us. And it's so wonderful to be able to see your work literally in action and your research in action. So just thank you for bringing your talents to us tonight. Uh, like I said, early next week, I will be sending out a link to all of this. So in case you missed it, in case you had to leave early, I know some people were in and out when those thunderstorms rolled through the Boston area. We had some people who had to head on out, um, so but came back in. So we'll have a full recording available for you and we'll be sure to send that out. Um, and I just want to let folks know too, this summer over the next couple of months, we're really focused on trying to increase our staffing and our visitor experience, but we'll be returning this fall with a lot more programming. You can visit our event calendar at sevengables.org. Uh, you can look up our next community conversation. We have an October movie night where we will be showing the 30 minute uh, Ben Wiki film, The House of the Seven Gables. And uh, we've got some other great things planned. So you don't want to miss out on that. And, you know, be sure to visit if you're local or not and planning a trip to Salem. We would love to have you. And uh, thank you to Rob and Richard. You guys are just outstanding. We always love working with Rob and Richard. I'm so delighted that we've had the introduction with you. Kaylee, thank you for helping out in the background tonight and for uh, answering questions and Zoom tech support and all the wonderful things you do for us. Um, and just all of you for joining us tonight. We hope that you get to go cool off now wherever you are and enjoy your summer. <laughs> we'll see you soon. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.